Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Ken. Dave. Good to see you, gentlemen. Uh, welcome, everyone, to episode 352. Yes, we've made it through 352, and we haven't been kicked off of YouTube or anywhere else yet. But <laughs> where the episode is, Why Was the Sin of Jeroboam So Devastating to Israel? And uh, Dr. Ricks, if you would start us out, that would be... Okay. We're in the age of groaners, so we're going to really groan one here, a real groaner. Okay, why didn't Emma go to South America? Why didn't she want to spend the summer in South America? She heard it was Chelly! 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 C-H-I-L-I, Chelly! Hmm. The box was slow. <laughs> I really do love you, Henry, the woman told um, Will June, but I can never marry a man who's an atheist. Um, he doesn't believe in anything, not even hell. His mother, her mother said, don't worry, honey, you marry him and you and I will really convince him there's a hell. <laughs> and one more old groaner that you all have probably heard before you say you don't go to services the church is full of hypocrites nothing but hypocrites my advice is don't let it bother you there's always room for one more <laughs> Here's one more. This is job interview phrases. Oh, one more. I, I one more groaner, real groaner. The man says, um, "You know that book's book, Ten Steps to Humility." He says, "Well, I made it in only seven. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so why was the sin of Jeroboam so devastating to Israel? When you read the, the Old Testament, it pops up all the time. The sin of Jeroboam, why was it so devastating? And I think it'll help us understand, well, actually, a lot of things, Old and New Testament, obviously, especially the New Testament, when we understand Jeroboam. Now, what happened was Solomon, even though the year 17, the, the king was supposed to obey certain laws, don't have too many wives, and a few other things. We assume Solomon should have known better, but as he got older, he collected more and more foreign wives. Also, they weren't supposed to have foreign wives. And they, the commentary says, well, that probably was diplomatic reasons. That's how you made diplomacy. You married the daughter of some great emperor. I understand all that, but Solomon got carried away many, many wives, and in his old age, they turned his heart to join them in worshiping pagan idols. And God was so mad, he told Solomon that the kingdom would be torn away from him because of, of his falling away in his latter years. And by the way, in case you think just because you're a senior citizen, you don't have to worry about falling away I wish that were necessarily true, but Solomon proves that is not necessarily true. You've heard that expression, there's no fool like an old fool. <clears throat> you know, um, the joke in my family is my, my grandmother got baptized probably within six months before she passed. And she was about 209 years old when she got baptized. So big joke was how much sin could she have done in six months? You know? <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. I, I think. <laughs> Let's read First Kings 11.34. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand because I have made him a ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I choose, chose because because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you ten tribes. 
And to his son I will give one tribe, that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. Father, I know it's off the subject, but Jerusalem is still an important city to God, even in these end times. I know it, you know, someone said, really, if you look at Jerusalem, it doesn't set controlling any vital natural resources, blocking any great river. I mean, in, in one sense, its only importance is because God made it important. It's still important. Anyway, um, but Ahijah, by the way, is the prophet who told um, Jeroboam, who was a, a major leader and builder in Solomon's administration, that he would get 10 tribes. And in a few years later, after the prophet gave that message, he got the 10 tribes. Um, by the way, something to help us understand that in most countries in the world, it was even true during the days of the American Revolution, the King of England was the titular head of the Church of England. Uh, kings and emperors, etc., whatever their other titles, Pharaoh, they wanted control of the people's religion as part of controlling the people. And so Jeroboam started thinking, well, wait a minute. The one thing I don't have, you know, the Northern Ten and Judah all have the same religion, and it's centered in Judah, in Jerusalem, in the temple. And when they're down there, they're under the influence of the, uh, you know, the king of Judah, not me. And that started to bother him. Um, you know, unlike other kings, he didn't have that control. So he started thinking. Let's go to 1 Kings 12, 26. And Jer Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord. Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. You know, when you when you read that, the first thing that, that strikes me is that he didn't really trust God. Because God, through the prophets, said, I'm giving you the northern ten. And it's like he's saying, yes, but I got to trust myself. I got to gain that extra control that I'm losing. Um, and he says, you know, Solomon's son is the rightful heir. I can't take the chance. Like he was doubting that God was going to back up his word. And isn't it easy for people, instead of having faith in God, we start to try to do it through human terms only? Absolutely. I think we're seeing that out there now. The, the human mind in and of itself is the enemy of God, so it's not going to understand God. You know, so if you understand that we naturally resist him, uh, that makes it a little easier for you to get past and say, let's get past me so that I can worship him. But our natural mind, is, it doesn't like it doesn't like to be told what to do, and, and especially when we want to do something else. So, and it's that's addressed in the Bible as well. Um, and Jeroboam started thinking only politically instead of, I'm assuming because he was chosen as one of the best leaders in the building program by Solomon, he's a very shrewd, smart man. He probably thought he got the 10 because of his shrewdness behind the scenes. And I'm not saying he didn't do political stuff behind the scenes, but he got it because God said he would get it. And God worked out events that, you know, Rehoboam did and said stupid things. You know the story, right? God arranged all that to happen for him. Um, and really, God can arrange things to work out the way God wants them to work out. Um, yeah, that's the thing. We have to work on God's time, God's plan. He called us all from different families and different places at different ages. He works. Some of us, some of us, you know, grow a little quicker than others. But we have to let God be in control of it. 
Yeah. Um, it's hard to really find a, a, a common example that's similar to Jeroboam, Rehoboam, but you look at someone like the Apostle Paul. Once you think about it, God gave him the perfect background, the witness to Judah. And yet, politically, that's the last guy they wanted to hear from. But God worked it out. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, it's really a beautiful picture. There is the um, fortress, the Roman soldiers built near the temple, with those uh, stairs that go up. And there was Paul at the top of the stairs with a phalanx of Roman soldiers at the bottom protecting him from a mob of maybe 30 or 40,000 screaming Jewish people, including the high priest. And then Paul speaks to them in Hebrew, they get silent. And he gets to witness to them, and they can't do anything to him. An army between him and them. I mean, you can see where God worked it out. Um, and Jeroboam wasn't trusting God to work it out. It's kind of, Paul was kind of a, a backward story. <clears throat> um, some of the other people from young men, uh, I believe Hezekiah was one as well, that uh, as they got power, they became more corrupt. Paul had power and gave it up. He did just the opposite. Um, and he went from persecuting the church to saying of all the apostles, I'm the least of them. For the things I hate, I do, you know. Um, and writing incredible letters and words to pull it together to the Gentile and the Hebrew people. Um, so Paul was kind of a backward story. He had it all and gave it up. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Um, um, <clears throat> but I think we have to remember that if God gives us something, do not start thinking, we did it on our own only and don't realize that God was, well, allowed us to get it. It's easy to give all the credit to self and your shrewdness. You know, I had, I had people say to me, well, I guess God didn't want me to go to this feast this year. And I go, did, did God quit your job? You know, um, uh, God says I can eat, you know, um, whatever. Yes, but if that's all you eat, it may not be healthy. Don't blame God for your stupidity, you know. But a guy said to me, I quit my job. Now I don't have the money to go to the feast. I guess God don't want me to go. What did you expect? <laughs> so. Right. By the way, you know what I've discovered? And I may have, God has maybe had to give me more help than others. But I found, not that I've done it well, but if you go to your bosses and tell them, you're going to take these days off and, you know, you don't have to give me a thorough explanation, but a little bit is personal and religious. In most cases, they say yes. Even the U.S. Army, when I was a lieutenant in the Army, said yes, which is kind of surprising. You think about it. You know, so this idea that uh, America is really a land, for the most part, where they respect religious freedom. Well, we used to be. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's until the turning around right now. Yeah, until oh, the yeah, COVID hit, and they have an excuse now to shut us down. Yeah, that's true. The the far left running these big cities are not any tolerant. Is not one of their main virtues. You notice it didn't take them long to get to that either. <laughs> yeah, we're tolerant of people that agree with us. That's about it. Yes, absolutely. So you can riot, you can burn, you can steal, you can pillage, you can destroy, uh, you can blind, you can attack, you can beat, you can do whatever you want as long as you don't pray. Don't be praying in public. Unless you're a Muslim, then you can get on your rug and do whatever you want. And, and the fact that they're burning American flags in Portland and the media... And no one's even noticed. You probably haven't even heard about it, right? It was in Christian. Oh, I've heard all about it. I follow it all. And, and and nobody even thinks anything you unusual about that. Yep. They of course they burned the flag, but they've been doing that for years, so it's not such a shocker. Um let's go to first Kings eleven thirty seven. It it's the same thing we said before. He had every reason mm -hmm. to to trust God. So I will take you, and you shall reign over all your heart desires, and you shall be king over Israel. 
Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments, and as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build for you an endearing house as I built for David, and you and I and will give Israel to you. And it says he would give Israel to them. So God, through the prophet, gave him a promise. He just didn't trust the promise. And like you were saying, uh, Dave, he chose the human way. What's the scripture? There's a way that seems right in the in the eye of man or in the mind of man, some to that effect. Um, the minute I do my own reasoning, um, I realize I'm I'm creating my own demise. You know. You know, and I think we got to guard against that right now. I mean, there's a lot of that. Is, I mean, as as American citizens, we're kind of letting that what's happening to this country kind of. I don't know if. It just seems like that seems to be taking center stage right now, and uh, maybe sometimes we need to uh, get our head out of the world and get it back into God's world. Because my my language is starting to suffer badly from the current events around the world. It's real. It's getting real close. Let me put it that. Way. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. there's only one way to describe something. You know. Well. And when you're looking at pure evil, I mean, these people, these rioters, somebody's feeding them. You know, this is a planned attack. They're being fed. They're they're getting whatever it is they need. Seventy whatever days they had to have eaten a meal in the last seventy days. They certainly have a lot of energy in the middle of the night. Yeah, they're and they're getting top notch, uh, top notch uh, equipment to go after. I mean, they're getting mill. Military grade lasers to blind these officers with, and uh, police shields. They've got the same riot shields of police. So, you know, somebody's buying them. Yep. Um, so, Jeroboam built a counterfeit religion to really obscure and people from worshiping the true religion, which was centered in Jerusalem and the temple. Um, and those are strategic changes. Um, and I wonder to myself, you think that Jeroboam innocently reasoned that it really doesn't matter if you change God's religion a little here, change it a little there, change it a little there. What difference does it matter? We're still worshiping the same God. Yeah, because it's constant. Uh, Constantine did the same thing. Um, I had a guy a couple years ago, he says, the Bible doesn't say to keep Saturday as Sabbath. This is pick a day. I said, where does it say pick a day? It just says pick a day. Said, but what day? Tell you to pick a day. How do you pick a day? Because in Genesis, he kind of picked one for us. And he argued with me. He says, well, my brother-in-law is a pastor, and he told me it said pick a day. <laughs> you need to pick a new brother. <laughs> brother-in-law. I said, I have him call me. He never did. Um, um, and by the way, let's go to the next verse, 1 Kings 12, 28. And he used advisors. They don't tell you advisors said, but I'm going to make a guess. Let's read that verse, and we'll tell you what we think the advisors told me. Therefore, the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought up, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Notice he said, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. So he believes it is the, uh, the God of Israel. Words, the God that brought these people out of Egypt. But we're going to worship him in a new way. We're changing things. And um, so they don't have to spend time going to Jerusalem and um, especially eight days, Feast of Tabernacles, where they'll be under the influence of his new rival for power, the king of Judah. Um, let's read 1 Kings 12, 32, get exactly what he did. 
All right, Jeroboam, Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priest of the high places which he had made. So he, he uh, made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month in the month which he had devised of his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. According to the commentators, he made himself high priest, at least for a while anyway. He was doing the priest, which also wasn't allowed in the Bible. Uh, so he was high priest as well as king, bringing you know, both offices into one. And he changed the... So the seventh month, he changed to the eighth month. And I wonder what the feast, what that the celebrations looked like in comparison to what we know about the pagan days. I guarantee you it looked like one of them. A lot of people think his feast, um, uh, because we think that those people uh, went with the uh, Assyrians into Central Europe, and I, you know, Isaac's son is one of the provinces of Germany. I got to look them all up, but you'll see what I mean looking on the map. They think that uh, Oktoberfest in Germany may have grown out of this, but we don't really have to know that for sure. What we do know is that he made a counterfeit of the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and the truth is, if someone says, well, you know, if the Catholic Church had some counterfeit days in there, you know, well, the Protestants pulled away from Catholic power, but they didn't pull away far enough. They didn't pull away at all. They just wanted either whatever their rules they didn't like. Uh, the, we, we think the priests should be able to get married, you know, or whatever. But everything else they kept the same. Yeah. Question is, well, did it make a difference to God? Let's go to first. Because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he had sinned and by which he had made Israel sin, because of his provocation with which he had provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. So you can see that it made God angry, his changing the religion. Um, now they're in a counterfeit system. One of the things that you'll notice about the Northern Ten as you read you know, the Book of Kings and some of the other biblical history books is the um, God is constantly condemning that system of Jeroboam and the Israelites get used to it. It prevents them like a block from knowing, even in a basic way, the true God of Israel. Uh, the counterfeit really blocks it. Um, and I think the world, the nominal world is that way, too. The things that they have that are non-biblical block them from really getting to know God the way they should. It's interesting. I've got a lady that I send our church service to every week, and she's been coming in and talking with me and, and agreeing with us a lot. And um, I had another lady, and I, she just she loves me to death. And I just said, She's very active in her church. She said, why do you go to church on Sunday? And she said, well, we always have. I said, but what's the fourth commandment? What does it say? It's the seventh day, and Sunday's the first day. If you look at the calendar, I said, ask your pastor why that is. And uh, I expect her to come back and say, he said, well, we, we keep the Lord's Day, because that's what they generally say. She came in today. I saw her in a parking lot, and I pointed and said, you come here. So she came over. I said, how are you doing? And I'm talking with her. And she said, my pastor, I, I brought that up to him, and he says it's been bothering him, and he's thinking about changing this over to having our services on Saturday. I said, tell him to expect to lose some of his people and to be spiritually blessed. And she smiled. She saw telling him. I said, good. good. Plant a seed. Because it, it takes very little to figure out Saturday's the day. I've heard of a few churches that have done that, and enough people survived 
that the pastor still kept something going. It's going from Saturday to Sunday. I mean, from Sunday to Saturday. I know one who switched and he lost everybody. Mm. But other than that, he was crazy. So, <laughs> and I know a guy. Only said, you, Dave. <laughs> I'll tell you later. I mean, he was crazy. He, um, <laughs> another guy told me that they do Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, and Sunday, and Sunday night. That way, everybody can have an opportunity to figure out what they want to do. So, doesn't it? Thousands of members. I would go on a Friday night. We, in fact, we did. Uh, once in a while, we would have services on Friday night um, so that Linda could attend with us. But, you know, Rick's wife's got some health issues that so made it hard. And then when the COVID scare came, everybody's like, we don't know what to do. And the hotels weren't sure if they wanted us there and that kind of thing. So I, tomorrow I'll probably have a house full of people. You know, the odd thing is, now people can do both. They can be with us on Friday night and learn the Bible little by little, better by better, a little bit here, a little bit. And then go to services on the Sabbath in the daytime. It's a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, the people were taught by those who did not know the Bible. Now, here's the way I see it. If you took um, the advisors to Jeroboam, and I can see these guys want power, keep the king in power, you know, the guys behind the throne. They said, look, um, we create our own religion, but what's the only thing that can block us from changing anything we want to change? It's the Levites. The Levites supposedly were to learn the Bible. They were learning the laws, and they administered the laws. They were like judges and health inspectors and people who knew, you know, God's, you know, the five, first five books of the Bible, the law part. Well, if you could remove the Levites, in effect, you could remove the Bible. Because, you know, obviously the printing press wasn't being invented for another uh, uh, more than 2,000 years. And scrolls were expensive, hard to get, and only a few people would have them. And, I, and actually, probably a lot of people didn't even know how to read. So the Levites were the Bible for the average person. So if you remove the Levites, it's like removing the Bible. And guess what Jeroboam did? Let's read uh, 1 Kings 12, 30. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan, and he made an house of high places, and made the priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. I mean, it makes sense. We don't need you Levites. We got other people who are eager and ready. And I imagine, you know, they get to wear a beautiful robe, but I'm sure the king gave, gave them whatever appropriate and relative to probably life in, those, in that world. It was a good job, don't you think? Yeah. If you want to hear something really scary. Now, I read this in a book. I have to presume it's true. That when a certain leader that had money wanted to get certain people to support abortion. She bribed a lot of Protestant ministers to preach that abortion is okay. Now, I only can tell you what I read. Would not Hard to believe that, right? Would not surprise me. And many of these ministers were probably poor, ignorant people who probably didn't know as much as you might think they would know. Because, you know, the Bible says that um, the knowledge should be at the priest's lips. They probably didn't well, know a lot. Well, they're already at a disadvantage because they don't have God's truth. They're already at a disadvantage because they're not having services on the Sabbath. They're not. They're, they're doing uh, Easter and they're doing uh, Christmas and all that. So they're already at a disadvantage, and they've already... Uh, whether they know it or not, they've already um, compromised the actual faith of God into doing those other things. So it's just one more thing to compromise, I guess. It's so horrible. Think of they wave money in front of these preachers, and now we want you to, to uh, support abortion and government run and institution run abortion, and uh, we'll find ways to get money to you. And that they would be willing to do that. 
But you know, 17, 18 years ago, there was an abortion doctor who had hundreds, it was a couple thousand, I think it was like 35 or 3,800 abortions he'd done. And a guy went to the church where this guy was sitting in the pews and shot him and uh, killed him. Now, what was that pastor saying? What was he teaching in there when you got a guy who's a serial killer? You're not telling him stop because you're getting 10% of it. Hmm. I never thought of it that way. But here's what I believe. That Jeroboam got priest who would preach. He, he was buying the priest. They'd preach anything he told them to preach for the month's paying them. They were bought and paid for. And, and um, you're going to say, well, what about Exodus 32 where they worshiped the golden calf and God was so mad at those people? I mean, that's almost one of the biggest events in the Old Testament when Moses was up to worship the golden calf. And they, they said the same thing Jeroboam did. This golden calf represents the God that took us out of Egypt. Well, anyone with any Bible knowledge would say, wait a minute, golden calf, no way. Remember Exodus 32. But my guess is the priests that here either were so biblically ignorant, they didn't know that, and or they didn't care as long as the money was there. And the Levites would know it, and they'd tell each other, wait a minute, we can't go along with this. He's only just got rid of them. And most of them went south to Judah. I see a lot of parallels between this and today's politics. Yeah. <laughs> Tons. <laughs> I mean, right when we started, I was starting. So what are your parallels, Ken? If you want to stay out of trouble. Well, I mean, it's paying off the politicians, for one, to get them to do whatever you want, and uh, replacing the high priests with the lowest of the uh, people is the same thing of taking out the police and replacing them with the thugs, which they want to do, or the social workers, so they can uh, smooth talk you into not uh, you know, committing that crime. You know, what they do, show up at the bank and say, please don't rob the bank, it would be you know, bad for morale or whatever. But, uh, I mean, you can see, there was one earlier, too, when we first started. I don't remember what it was, but I'm just seeing a lot of parallels. It's, it, the only reason you see it is because it's corruption from the top down, and you can see that in politics today, corruption and how they function. Nothing's changed in the last, you know, 2,500 years in how corruption is, works. It's the same as it's always been. Yeah, I mean, obviously. So I'm just seeing these little bits and pieces. You know, you're right. If you think about it, I mean, there have always been problems in American politics and pettiness, so no, no one's going to. But generally speaking, I'm generalizing now. You couldn't get a high position like a Senate seat or president or a cabinet position unless you would accomplish something significant in your life or at least been in politics for a number of years and worked your way up. But have you noticed that is not so true. Someone comes out of nowhere, like, should I mention that that lady from New York? Oh, I won't mention her name. Stay out of trouble. I don't remember. Bartender to, anyway, yes. the leader of the party. and but, but the point I'm getting at is, you see what I'm saying, don't you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you listen to some of these congressmen talk, and you think, that guy knows nothing about nothing. <laughs> There's a guy running for president right now that doesn't know he's running for president. He's running for Senate, haven't you heard? He's not going to say anything. And how he's going to get the black vote, I don't know after after yesterday. It's scary. Um, but I do think we're putting people with less knowledge in higher position than they used to be. Not that it was ever perfect. I'm, you know, No way of saying anything like that. But you can sense that, can't you? Yeah, they're trying to put a guy who doesn't know his, I mean, he doesn't know what day it is, and they're trying to put him in the highest position on the planet. He literally may answer a question with potato. That was Dan Quayle, sorry. Well, maybe he can't spell potato. <laughs> also, he was made going to the feast easier by having regional sites now, obviously, he was blocking 
the road to Jerusalem because one was like on the same road to Jerusalem, but 10 miles further north. So nobody had an excuse to go past there. They probably tried to prevent that. But he made it easier for people to go to the feast. The question we want to ask, is the easy way ever the best way? Nope. Never. Well, not usually. Yeah, I'm going to go with not usually, but um, on occasion. Yeah, but you know. the easy way is using, like, for, let's say if somebody says, well, you know, travel is tough. Why don't we just have a feast at my house and two or three people live close to me. We'll have a feast at Tabernacles in my house three or four times during the week. Well, I mean, that's easier and less expensive. Nobody has to spend any money. But is that I want to quote Ted Cotton. He got up when you're at the feast and he's doing a sermon at and he goes, God had to command me to do this. <laughs> to come here, to eat, to stay in a resort, to look at the beautiful ocean, be with all you people, be invited everywhere, be treated with such love. He had to command me to do this. <laughs> That's a great example of, of being hard-headed, I guess. He had to be commanded to take a break. You know, a really nice eight-day break. And uh, and also the other the other bad thing was the golden calf is an idol. We might even someday do a program on why God hates idolatry because I know it's a deep subject. But we were discussing it in our local church in our Bible study. We came to this conclusion. You know, God says, "Don't make um, a likeness of anything you see in heaven or earth, whatever you think you see, and say that's God. Make a drawing, carving." What do you want to call it? Statue of it. Um, and and you could even argue that m at least Moses saw God's backside and and three of the apostles, it was in a vision, but they saw God briefly. But there's no indication they ever made a drawing or a description of what God looked like for people to worship. Because I guess you two can give me your thoughts. God is so great that a uh, drawing, painting, statue, figurine, nothing we could do would really capture the greatness of God. Nothing in the physical universe that you could manipulate could do exa exactly what you said. You can't recreate that in painting and sculpture. You couldn't recreate that. You would be doing God a great injustice to try and capture his image. You, just you mean like the... Catholic Church didn't do a good job with it when they captured to you. No, 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 not at all. The four hundred thousand images you see, remember the creepy uh, Catholic Church is probably about the creepiest place on earth. I think I'd rather go to one of them goofball uh, haunted houses at Halloween than to walk in a Catholic Church and see all that junk on the. It's they on their monstrous, which is the thing that they worship or whatever. It's got every pagan symbol known. Because remember, Catholic means universal. They worship demons. They worship God. They worship Jesus. They worship Satan. They worship the goats and the cows. and the, It means they worship everything. And one of their songs or chants that they do, they call Lucifer the father of Satan. Hmm. I saved it on my phone. And you know, Lucifer is one of the three archangels. Yeah, they say, I'm sorry, they say Lucifer is, I'm sorry, is the father of Jesus. I mis misquoted that. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there is a church, we'll name their names. They say Christ and Lucifer are brother right. equal level. I won't name the church because I'll get in trouble. It'll upset people. But because I have some relatives who are in that church, at least a few that are left in there. But, but you get the general idea. There are a lot of, God does not want us to try to put God, to picture God in any idol. When they made the golden calf, no matter what his good intentions were, some say he thought the true God was a spirit hovering over the golden calf. It was simply a, a method of channeling God. And commentators write a lot of nice things. Even if he thought that, God doesn't want it. Nope. Man, for some reason, has a desire that he should look at something, a representation of something. It, and it, what it does is it avoids the heart. I mean, if you need to see something or hear something, then you can avoid, I mean, you're, 
It doesn't work. <laughs> you know the thing. You know. No, sir, it just does you can't you cannot put God in a box. You can't put him in and and put him in your little world that fits your needs and your wants and your desires. It's not that way and it should And I understand that I'm humanly you get the and they They've dug up a lot of them because they're made of metal or stone, so they didn't decay. These little metal figurines of uh, <clears throat> Asherah, well, I think in, in Rome and Latin it's Venus, but same god, different names. And they got these little statues, and I guess they have coins with bales on them and sun worship symbols. And they have and other gods, too. I think God of the ocean and all kinds of stuff. And you put one of these in your pocket that's going to protect you when you're at sea or whatever. I understand that desire, but God does not want to be put in a little figurine like that. And the, the, the Asians have all the same things. Um, they have a God over the water, a God over this. They have a God of war. Busa Ganashi, the Japanese have a god of war. Uh, they have a god of clouds. They have a thunder god. I mean, they got a lot of gods. In fact, kamikaze means god of the wind. Hmm. The sacred wind, right? Or something like that. The wind god, literally. Wind god. Yeah. The, uh, and a lot of uh, cultures, god is in the spirit of animals. I'm, don't ask me to explain it. I'm just saying there's the in the spirit of the bear, the spirit of the wolf, the spirit of the eagle. You get some feel so you can get a little wolf's a power. I don't know, whatever they get. Something little, and you got the animal spirit with you. But you can see how that undercuts the real God. How did that spirit work for that animal? If I've got his foot. <laughs> <laughs> that the lucky rabbit. <laughs> Not so lucky for the rabbit. Or you or you have the horns of, is it the rhinoceros horn is so big in Asia? But I guess it, it varies in other in bulls' horns. And yeah, it did a lot, them a lot of good, didn't it? Usually if you have a rabbit foot, he was the slowest rabbit in the field. <laughs> what about tiger's teeth? That, that sounds impressive, right? The necklace with tiger's, never mind. You know, Down here, shark's teeth everywhere. Yeah, um, but God doesn't like that. Um, um, let's see, do we read Isaiah 30, 10? This is what God thinks of false prophets in general, but I think it applies to the kind of priest that Jeroboam was paying for. Who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy. To us, write things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get out of the way, turn aside from the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. In other words, Jeremiah, Isaiah was saying, God told him that you bad news priests of Israel and Judah, you're blocking people from reaching the real God, like a roadblock. Cease from being in front of us. We, and that's what their idolatry was doing. And the interesting thing, when you look at the history of, of the Northern Ten, they never repented. They went from bad king, bad king, worst king, bad king, the worst ever, bad king, the very, very, very worst ever, where Judah, because they didn't change the basic religious system, at least not until the very, very, very end, Judah had a number of revivals and benefit, benefited and were blessed accordingly. And you could argue... Maybe this was a little scary, but you can even argue maybe the Jewish people are still being blessed because Israel is still a nation. You know that Israel is one of the most high-tech um, invention nations for the size of its population in the whole world. They've invented a lot of stuff. So you could argue that considering where they are and their small population, they're a very blessed country. They are uh, Glenn Beck did a program where he went um, went to Israel and Palestine, and he said when you leave the Palestinian area and walk into Israel, it's like any major city in America. When you walk into the the Palestinian area, it's a total slum. He said the people are just different, and uh, 
So, you know, I don't know. I've never been there. And I well, ain't nowhere, so. I think they're still being blessed by God. Now, they do have the problem about half their population is close. To, they're somewhat secular. Maybe not totally secular, but somewhat. So I think Judah has a problem of they need to do a little more repenting currently, but so does America. So do a lot of us, right? But um, as we're getting close to the end of the program, um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, 14, because I think Paul's making a point that we need to never... Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. There are a lot of sins that are bad. But Paul is saying idolatry, you know, that's the number one thing God says in the Ten Commandments is have nothing before the true God. So we have to be careful not to idolize um, movie stars, um, even wealth. You can idolize wealth or whatever you want to idolize. And I'm not, you know, I, um, or the... Whoever you think is the biggest star out there, that's your idol. That's not a good idea. Any thoughts, David? I, I think that when people um, fall into that, they don't know that's what they're doing. They don't realize that they're obsessed with something. Um, and... Um, but they just there's no way that's more important than God. Well, when did you pray last? And when did you play that video game last, or whatever it is that you you know you're addicted to? Um, so if people don't realize, um, they don't search themselves, and you have to be baptized. You have to be called before you'll search yourself and say what is more most important here. Yep. If you're not sure, ask your wife. She'll help you figure it out. <laughs> yeah, one thing is, by the way, when you look at what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, it is true that Paul told the, the mature Christians, don't worry about meat offered to idols. The idol is nothing. What they worship is nothing. These demons don't exist. However, in 1 Corinthians 10, 20, he gave them a warning. Let's read 1 Corinthians Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. So even though, so even though the God they're worshiping is false, behind all that mumble jumble at the pagan temples were demon influences. And then I keep thinking of demonstration. Demonstration. And whenever there's a demonstration at night, have you noticed that bad things often happen? I had a guy tell me years ago, he's a young guy and he just talks a little slow. And he looked at me and said, you know, there's more sin done on the Sabbath than any other day of the week. Because Sunday you got to get up and go to church. Monday through Friday, you got to go to work. Friday night comes, you head out and sin. He's probably right, isn't he? <laughs> I agreed with him. Let's read uh, 2 Kings twenty two fifty two. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother Jezebel and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Who had made Israel sin, for he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger, according to all that his father had done. You want me to go into Second Kings? Oh, let's make a quick comment. Oh, let's make a quick comment before we read the next one. Uh, the um, now you might say from when when Jezebel came along, Ahazi is her son, we're referring to. Israel switched, the northern ten switched from a counterfeit religion to out-and-out -out Baal worship. But I would argue that the sins of Jeroboam left the people spiritually weaker and easier. They were spiritually sitting ducks to be deceived by Jezebel. 
Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It'd be like, I hear this guy on the radio. He's talking about how your kids go off to college and they come back hating God, maybe even disrespecting their parents. He says, the problem is you never taught them to love God to begin with. Why are they deceived? Because they were never taught. He's trying to get people to teach their kids about God when they're growing up more so. But can you see if they were spiritually so compromised, and then here comes Jezebel um, and all her priests of, um, I think, fertility. You can see how you could push that nation over into total out-and-out Baal worship. I heard somebody the other day said they've taken religion out of schools. So well, now they're taking your kid out of school. Or are you going to put religion in your home? There's a prime opportunity yelling. They don't let them pray in school. They don't have anything to talk about God. This is a prime opportunity for you to become that homeschool teacher who does just that. You know, one guy said one good possibility is if a lot of schools are, are closed to just uh, learning online, more parents will say, if that's the case, why not homeschool? They are already forming these, uh, that's not club, but they're forming these uh, small cadres of uh, like five or six or seven kid families, and they get together, they all get together at a location, and they share the, the uh, teaching of the kids. They share the, uh, the, the work, and if that takes off, and enough of it takes off in a generation we'll have there won't we won't have half the problems we have today cuz the biggest problem is that we let these marxist teachers that have been taught and trained in these marxist universities to destroy our kids minds with lies and trash and not teach actual history if that gets to enough of the population they're done they will realize this by the way fairly quick and they will get these schools back in action or they're going to try and find a way to end the other they'll, they'll work it out there's just too early into this but eventually they'll figure out whoops these kids aren't we're not being able to destroy their minds uh, we got to get that back and they'll eventually figure it out. they're doing yeah. it in churches because there's a church that invites me every year to do it a self-defense class and uh they're generally very nice people, nice kids. By the way, years ago, during the days of Jim Crow, a lot of uh, little towns, the kids went to school in church basements. I'm not saying everything was hunky-dory, but there was a little more Christianity in the school just because of where it was. Yeah, you know what? And in fact, churches that own their own, you know, they have their own church building and that, if they were smart, they would open their churches up to these uh, these clubs or whatever they call them, these groups of people and help them if they were smart. You know, they would do that and try to get these kids into an atmosphere and away from, you know, an atmosphere of learning and love away from this false trash they teach in high school or where in the in the public schools today. I wish they just. I have, I have a prediction going on what you said, Ken. Let's say if the teachers union found out, wait a minute, we're losing 15 to 20 percent of our market. You know, parents who don't plan on sending their kids, at least for many, many years, back to public schools are going to try to homeschool them. I'll bet you they may come off strike and, and pressure the state government because they have a lot of government influence to close down homeschools, private schools. I think the ones in L.A. and Chicago are already demanding charter schools be outlawed. I mean, the union is just saying that openly. You know, I've had a couple of teachers tell me that that they're trying to do away with teachers, make everything virtual, so every kid in the whole world will be taught the same curriculum, which excludes God and all of that. Which they're already doing. I mean, they already exclude God in all the schools anyway. But maybe that's what their official goal is. Then they got to shut down the homeschooling eventually. So, which they've been trying to do that for years, depending on the state you're in. But uh, yeah, they're gonna. Yeah, another thing is they may figure on they're so far along into this Marxist takeover that they don't need to do this. That they're they're gonna win soon. I don't we'll see. But socialist governments, and you can study it, um, do not allow homeschooling. And if there are private schools, they control. Influ- they have rules for them, so they have to teach what the government wants. In other words. 
socialist governments are big power, you know, they're not individual liberty governments. And education is too big an area to allow uh, parents to decide. Just like false religions. We want control of the people and their minds. Well, I had a teacher tell me a couple weeks ago that she was <clears throat> at her school, they don't really bother her any, and that um, she has got the kids together before and did a group prayer, like somebody's grandmother was sick or whatever, and she asked, do you guys mind? Let's do this. And then and the parents come in and tell her thank you. So That's it's, wonderful. It's going to take one it's going to take one parent to complain. Yeah, they'll probably do that one of these days. Let's go to 2 Kings 13. All right. Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin. They walked therein, and there remained also the, Asher, the uh, Asherah in Samaria. I know it's Samaria is a northern ten. In other words, over time, they could never get rid of the false religion. Is this one? Even though God kicked out various dynasties, like the new dynasty, yeah, the people kept. The sin of Jeroboam, the false religion, survived. And it was one of the reasons that they went into captivity much earlier than Judah did. Um, and we could argue that a spiritually dainty of God's religious system, because um, people argue, I've heard this argument, well, what difference does it make Saturday, Sunday? By the way, do you know when Worldwide was apostatizing, to make it easy, they said, well, we'll have services on Saturday and Sunday both. You can choose. You knew what that was all about, didn't you? Oh, yeah. They don't do that. Yeah, they didn't. They, they quit doing that shortly after. I'm yeah, after a year or two. Oh, this is too confusing. This is too big a mess. And they had been working on more and more people going on Sunday, of course. We just got to drop Saturday. Everybody go to Sunday. I knew that's what they're going to end up even when they started. It was just a way to ease people into it. They, um, had a, uh, <clears throat> my father put together a questionnaire and I said, do you think we should just keep the Feast of Tabernacles during Christmas time uh, or should we keep it on um, name different times? Another question was, um, do we think we should keep Christmas, but actually on the day that Jesus was actually born and uh, and people in worldwide were answer, some answered yes, let's keep it on the day that he was born. Because they had no idea that nobody knows when that was. And then he said, he goes, I was shocked at the answers that I got back on these questionnaires. By the way, one of the things that Worldwide did, for those who wanted the feast, they picked a summer date. Was it late July or something like that? August, late July. And they'd have a few days at various camp places where people could sort of keep the feast. It wasn't quite the feast, but it was sort of the feast. If you really want to do it, you can still do it. For the older folks, and and in the summer it's more convenient for for parents and you know kids are out of school and it's easier on your job take a summer vacation for three four days. See how convenient that was. Yeah. When what God wanted. Um, well, our final scripture. Let's put that one in. First Corinthians ten twenty one. A shocker, but it's worth reading. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Now, I realize that we're not accusing the nominal Christians of being demon worshipers. I'm not saying that. But what Paul is saying, though, if you know the truth, like most of us should know it by now, we're learning it. If you know the truth, you have to forsake, because they were in a world in Corinth where there were pagan temples all over the place. And a whole bunch of stuff that we don't even want to mention was going on. A lot of pagan stuff was going on. And he said, you you got to give all that stuff up. You can't compromise with it. And that's the, isn't that the temptation we want to compromise for popularity's sake? Oh. You know what? Well, I guess that's the final thought. Um, let me ask you the question. Um, one of the big issues is big tech censoring the truth. I heard that TikTok, 
the president was trying to demand that if if the Chinese sell TikTok majority to American owners, they'd be allowed to operate in America. He's trying to block them um, as part of, I guess, the trade war with China. Any idea, any thoughts on that? And will it work? Well, I mean, it's one of the oldest. I mean, I mean, he's he just basically told uh, China if you you you'll either because the number one uh, consumers of TikTok are the United States. We are the biggest part of that uh, company. You know, we use it more than anybody else. And he basically told him, "Look, you can sell it to to uh, uh, Microsoft, or we're going to ban it." So basically, he's like, he's he's coming out saying, either you you sell it to Microsoft, which that's what Microsoft wants, or we're going to ban you, which means you'll get no money, hardly. So I mean, it's just a just a, I don't know how to, but I mean, it was one of the oldest tricks in the book, you know. So that's so what the they're going to do. Company yes. does, I think was if it the American company doesn't go ahead twenty. Jim. Someone estimated they're worth twenty billion. I don't remember. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think they said they're willing to pay twenty billion for this. I know a friend of mine's daughter put a video on, got over a million views. <clears throat> what? <clears throat> yeah, and in a very short time too. Wow, that is amazing. I've heard a few cases where um, young people, at least one, I'm dropping out of college and I'm gonna open up an internet business online, and I'm going to make plenty of money. Now, I have no idea if it succeeded, but it is not an impossibility, is it, anymore? That that could happen. It's less of a possibility nowadays, but it's still possible. There's so many, so much competition. There's so right? many people out there doing so many different things. It uh, It's diluted. I mean, look at Twitter. I mean, there's a couple of other sites trying to take off. They just can't get out of the gate. I mean, there's Parler and there's like MeWe or WeMe or whatever. They're trying to be a knockoff of uh, Twitter and they really can't get going. No one wants to, you know, all your friends are on these platforms and no one, you can't get all your friends or enough of your friends off of those platforms to join you. So you're stuck kind of hanging into the old platform and the new one doesn't get ahead, doesn't, you know, can't get stuck. Just before we get off the air, Dr. Ricks, I sent you a video uh, via text. Uh, thought you might find it interesting. It's three minutes long or something. Okay, good. So I well, just sent it in Good. Prophetically, I guess it's just a question of how's America doing compared to the rest of the world and how's China doing. We don't know for sure. But I heard, heard hints this morning. Now, you know, this is just with one analyst. America's economy, considering all the you know, blue states dragging their feet and other things, America's economy is doing better. About half the people who lost their jobs because of COVID, half of those jobs have come back. I realize that's not humongous, but it's a move in the right direction. The stock market is within 2 or 3% of an all-time high, which is a bit of a shock. Yeah, yeah. I noticed yeah. one thing. Something bad. One thing, and uh, just as a note, uh, gold and silver are way up in price, which means we could be seeing some inflation coming. I know currently, right now, interest rates are as low as I think they've ever been. Um, I'm, I just bought this house a couple, two and a half years ago. I'm about to refinance it because interest rates are so low right now. I, I thought the interest rate I got, you know, a couple years ago was good, but they're it's almost half now to what it was. Wow. Uh, by the way, now. Is, how low is it now? I don't know how low it is. Can you give me? Two and a half percent. One point nine. She said one Yeah, I heard nine. two and a half. Wow. I remember when you houses were going for like 14% interest to finance. This is many years ago. Or even 7% or 6 or 7 was considered not bad. Now it's 1.9. Right. So the, I guess the Federal Reserve is doing everything it can to pump the economy. Uh, here's what one so-called expert says: People have been saying to him for the last year or two, our government's overspending, the dollar is going to collapse. 
He said, but the one thing they keep forgetting, now I'm giving you what one analyst who thinks he's an expert said, the problem with it, the, doc, the dollar rose this week too, which you said, how does that make any sense? The dollar rose and gold rose. He said, the problem is there's nowhere else, if you're an international investor, to yeah. put your money. There are problems everywhere, maybe one or two exceptions, some smaller country, but for a big, robust economy, America's the only trustworthy game out there. So money pours toward the dollar and Wall Street, according to him, even though our government is spending more than they should. Does that all make sense? Oh, yeah, because if, if that's all, you, it's, we're the best there is. We're not good, but we're the best there is. I mean, gold is over 2,000 an ounce. Silver's yeah. over 28 an ounce now. And yet the, the dollar bill is still rising a little bit and still solid. It's still the reserve currency of most of the world. Now, of course, the, the scary thing is if America collapses and falls, the world will be set for an economic tsunami. Would you agree that's how it looks at this point? Let's wait and see what happens. But America is still crucial to the, I think, both the military hegemony and the political stability of the world. And then I think of Joe Biden being in charge. No laughing. Okay, <laughs> well, we're, everybody just holds their so breath when they... 48, 43. We and, 24. <clears throat> well, um, I do think this guy also says if, if Biden wins, there will be a deep drop in the stock market. He didn't. He's not a total class, but it's going to really go down. Oh yeah, everything's going to drop. Now, People are pulling back from everything. It's drop. You want to see an economy drop overnight? The minute, if I don't think it's going to happen, but if he was to win overnight, the economy would nosedive. Nobody would spend money on anything. Because they'd be worried about tax increases, the uh, the Green New Deal, overregulation, all of which are bad on yep. the economy. By the way, next, I don't want to get anybody scared because no one knows what will happen. We know. Next week, we're going to look at um, the church was uh, considered a sect within Judaism in its early years. And, and understanding that will explain many things, including why we keep the Sabbath. And it would be a good thing for people to watch the program so that if you had to defend the Sabbath biblically, you could do it. Because there are a couple verses that are misunderstood, which I guess that's the way it goes. And if you don't understand the background of the Bible, you can misunderstand it. So, and Dave, don't go anywhere after the program. I got to find out where you found that one point nine. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, glad everyone could make it. Uh, uh, hope uh, hope everyone has a rest of their Sabbath is wonderful. And uh, wherever you're meeting, whether it's online or in person, hopefully in person. But uh, we'll see everyone here next week. And good night. happy you could make it so glad you are here and hope that we've been able to make God's word more clear until next time may God be with you in everything you try but for now till next week we've got to say goodbye